Michigan Out of Doors Online is brought to you in part by Mr. Muskie Charters, offering full-service guided fishing trips for walleye, muskie, bass, and sturgeon on Lake St. Clair and the Detroit and St. Clair Rivers. Booking information is online at mrmuskycharters.com. By Grilla Grills of Holland, Michigan, makers of wood pellet, charcoal grills, and professional pellet smokers. Grilla Grills are designed for ease of use to improve your grilling or smoking skills. More information at GrillaGrills.com. Hey everybody, welcome to Michigan Out of Doors. I'm Jenny olson Silic, and we've got an all new show for you this week. Jordan Brown is gonna take us out for a day of bass fishing with a couple of buddies in the mid-Michigan area. You won't wanna miss that story. And as promised, we're gonna start our discussions about our deer herd here in Michigan this week. Well, that's right, Jenny. We are launching part one in a three-part series on deer management here in the state of Michigan, specifically chronic wasting disease management and uh, the baiting and feeding ban. Those are going to be kind of the main things we talk about. On this week's show, we're going to sit down with Russ Mason from the DNR, the wildlife chief, and get their perspective on that issue. So lots of good stuff on this week's show. You stay tuned. I'm Jimmy Gretzinger. It's time for Michigan Out of Doors. From the first spring rains to the soft summer breeze, Dancing on the pine forest floor The autumn colors catch your eyes Here come the crystal winter skies It's Michigan, Michigan out of doors What a beautiful day in the woods Someday our children all will see This is their finest legacy The wonder and the love of Michigan As the wind comes whispering through the trees The sweet smell of nature's in the air Great lakes to the quiet stream, shining like a sportsman's dream. It's a love of Michigan we all share. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by By Country Smokehouse, a sportsman's meat processor and Michigan destination since 1988. Offers a variety of homemade smoked meats and Michigan-made products in-store and online. The Country Smokehouse features an outdoor barbecue and bar. Details at countrysmokehouse.com. By G5 Outdoors makers of the Quest and Prime bows, manufactured and designed in Memphis, Michigan. G5 offers a line of archery bows, broadheads, and accessories on the web at g5outdoors.com. To those who say we can't build a healthy economy while protecting the environment, DTE Energy has something to say. We're already doing it. Because you don't get to the forefront of cleaner, efficient energy by talking about it. DTE Energy. Soaking in the rich tradition of Michigan hunting for over 30 years, Vanguard is proud to sponsor our friends at Michigan Out of Doors TV. Well, we are here today with Russ Mason from the DNR, the Chief of the Wildlife Division. And Russ, let's just hop right into it. If I'm a deer hunter here in Michigan this year, what are some of the new regulations that I need to be aware of? Well, there are a couple of things. First, obviously, there's, as we told people last year, by the way, you know, this has been a year coming. There's a, there's a baiting and feeding ban in the Lower Peninsula, um, which is important. I guess we'll get into that, as well as uh, some, some baiting and feeding ban in a very localized area in the UP as well. Uh, we're doing an experiment in five counties on the west side of the central lower peninsula to look at the potential impacts of mandatory antler point restrictions on antlerless harvest to see whether or not uh, a point restriction can actually drive antlerless harvest. And folks, some folks would say that's silly, it wouldn't work. Some folks would say, well, of course it'll happen. The, the fact of the matter is we don't have data. That study also will give us some really valuable information about uh, sort of deer demographics because you know we typically get that off the of harvest and we say well that's you know what we harvest must reflect what's out there well yeah maybe this is going to give us independent numbers which is going to be very useful to us so there'll be some changes to point restrictions over there that are important um, there are a few other things the the scents um, and the food lures long story short if it's a food-based lure deer can't touch it there's the no touching rule so you you, you've got to have it high enough the deer can get their face into it. And the idea there is to sort of prevent that contact, which could leave contaminant that would then affect other deer. Uh, the urine scents 
aren't covered by that. So if you wanted okay. to make an artificial scrape or something along those lines, they would not be covered. And uh, we're less worried about some of that stuff, perhaps, uh, than, uh, than others might think we should be. We have the ATA standards making sure that those, those urines are as likely to be free of contaminants as, as possible. And while we're talking about scents, so the ones that are food-based, those are the ones that would, so if it's an apple, anything apple-related. Apple scent, pumpkin scent, I don't know. You're, you those got are a, You got an incense candle with you in the blind. But if you had a dough and heat thing, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. All right. Well, I think the biggest one that we see from our viewers uh, is the baiting ban. Yeah. Um, and I think for most people who hunt, I, I know you've done a little bit of deer hunting in your life over the years, and I've done a little bit, and deer live nose to nose and nose to butt and nose to everything so for the i think a lot of our viewers are saying well why would you ban baiting how is that going to stop the spread of cwd and to them you would say okay well actually there's two pieces to this so i'll tell you the why first and then it's going to get a little bigger because i do that on a regular basis so so the the why is you know there are lots of things that we cannot control deer social animals they get together uh, and there's apple trees and, and oak trees with acorns and deer get together there. But baiting is a little bit different than all of those things because it's a place that has got concentrated food year after year or, or, or mineral or something year after year after year. And it ends up almost being a contaminated site. So it's much more attractive to large numbers of animals that will come there. We know that congregating animals transmits disease. That's not it's just not open to discussion. I mean, that's, you know, you go to the buffet line, there's a reason there's glass over the salad because you don't want to be eating something that somebody else sneezed on. Same principle here. So we're doing what we can to prevent those contacts. So that's what the baiting ban is designed to do. But there's a bigger issue here, a significantly bigger issue. And, and from my perspective anyway, and um, Dan O'Brien, our epidemiologist, actually the way he put it resonates with me. Maybe it'll resonate with other people, and that is to say for disease management, whether it's CWD or tuberculosis, but especially CWD, how you hunt, hmm. how you hunt is more important than whether you are successful. Sort of the performance art of hunting is more important than whether or not you are successful. Preventing this disease is more important than whether you put a deer in the bed of your truck. And what we're asking hunters to do, and it's an interesting question, and I think the jury's out on it a little bit, are, are hunters just recreationists? And so they're out there to get a deer, to take it home, to put it in the freezer, la, 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 la. Or are they conservationists who happen to express their, their interest in, in wildlife and conservation through hunting? Mm -hmm. There are different ways of looking at the world. And, and I want to believe, and these regulations are designed to sort of take advantage of that belief, I guess, that hunters are conservationists and they'll do what's right for the species, although it may compromise their ability to take a deer. And that's a good point. And I think, and I've kind of come full circle on this. I think I was in that camp for a long time of saying, it would probably be good for hunters to be more conservation minded and more about uh, if we got rid of baiting, it would ch people would probably become better hunters. And, and, and I've kind of come full circle to where I'm now because there's a lot of guys that won't hunt if they don't have bait. And so my concern now, and, and maybe I'm wrong, I'm trying to say what's more important, the deer hunter or the deer? You know, it's not an easy question. Yeah. It, it, it's not. We're asking people to change. And, and the reason is, you know, what we've done before, it will never be that way again. Mm. We have diseases now that will take decades to overcome. It's not like, well, we'll do a couple of things and, and a year from now it'll be just like it was. No, it won't. And baiting is the one world, component of that, Baiting right? is one piece of that it's not puzzle. The... Baiting, uh, carcass movement, you know, there, there are a number of pieces to this that are important. Hunters will have to think and about themselves differently. And let me put it another way. I'm very concerned about R3, you know, recruitment, retention, reactivation, just like everybody else. The general public will support hunting if they see hunters as conservationists. Mm. They will not, in my view, support hunting if hunters are just seen as a bunch of recreationists. Mm. And so if we, wanna, if we wanna show the general public, the 9.5 million people in this state that do not hunt, but right now aren't against hunting, yeah. that we are truly conservationists, that we truly care about the same resource that they care about, 
then we should be exp thinking of ourselves always in that lens. We are conservationists first and we express ourselves through hunting as opposed to hunters first and yeah, we'll say something about conservation because it's polite. Can you be a conservationist and still hunt over bait? I don't, given the available science, I'm going to just have to say no, you can't do that. They, they just, it, you know, given all of the data that are out there and there's a boatload of it, uh, no, you can't. And you know, guys will say, well, you haven't proven that? Well, that's, you know, scientists, you get, and you know this as well, you get 10 of them in a room and you want them to make a declarative statement. Hmm. They wouldn't do that if you put a gun to their head. The probability suggests, the evidence indicates, they aren't going to say like, somebody on the other side might, I know that the facts are, scientists are very guarded, but you will not find a scientist anywhere working for any agency that will tell you that baiting is a good idea. And furthermore, by the way, you know, it's popular to think that scientists, there's mavericks out there. No, there's not. If there's a ma maverick scientist, you know what they are? Wrong. As it turns out, you want to know what science is about? You go with the herd. Now, is there a number in my, the department maybe has this percentage of hunters that won't hunt this year? Cause they're like, you know what? The regulations are too, uh, you know, I'm not going to buy a hunting license this year. And I'm sure if it's 1%, no big deal. If, if you see the tags go down by 50%, mm -hmm. is that enough to, is there a number in there where the DNR says, Hey, if we're losing 30% of our hunters, that's more important than if we just re-implement baiting. You know, here's, here's, there's another way to put that. I know I'm dancing on this line. The commission knows that the director knows that. And so when people say all the department wants to do is make money, mm -hmm. we know this is going to hurt our bottom line mm -hmm. and we're doing it anyway because mm -hmm. we want to do what's best for the resource in the future. I don't know what that number is going to, honest to gosh, I don't know what that number is going to be. There are probably some guys that, that won't go. Just to kind of wrap stuff up, just a couple of thoughts from some of our viewers. One of them, and we had a lot of people that chimed in on the baiting thing. That was a big, a big one. Um, but uh, one, of, one of the folks asked the question of, if we're gonna ban baiting, why aren't we banning food plots? And to that you would say? They're not the same thing. Once again, you know, baiting is a space, you know, we're standing in it. Um, it's while it's true that there are no regulations about how big a food plot has to be, you know, generally speaking, they're a couple of acres or five acres or whatever. So they do distribute the deer a little bit differently. They're not the same kind of, you know, fighting over a beet kind of a thing. So they aren't, uh, at least from our perspective, they don't present the same quantitative risk. But again, going back to the issue at hand, frankly, if a guy only was planting, you know, a tenth of an acre. Or what about, a, what about a six foot by six foot spot? You know, and, and that goes back to my point, our hunters conservationists first. If you want to beat the system, you can figure it out. Last time I was on TV, somebody called up and said, you know, if I take a post hole digger out there and dig holes and stick my beat in that, is that a food plot or is that a bait pile? And I said, you know, good try cowboy. You, you can't <laughs> kill coyotes if you leave your rifle in the truck. The point isn't to find ways to get around things. The point is to act like a conservationist and, and, and to, to demonstrate that ethic, which is not just important for the resource today, but very likely will be key to the survival of hunting in the future. Okay, I think that's a good answer. And then uh, one of the other viewers said, you know, okay, we, we get the baiting ban. Why are in Gratiot County and other counties around here, the USDA coming in with sharpshooters, but they're using bait. So it's okay for these sharpshooters who are gonna do that to use bait, but we can't, it makes no sense. What would you say to that? Well, I guess the, the simple answer is hunters hunt. When I get wildlife services out there, they kill. So they'll go in and say they'll, they'll use a spin feeder. There's got a camera on it. As soon as they got deer, they show up and they kill everything that comes to that camera. Hmm. Every single deer. They're not, oh, that's a nice one. I think, I'll, no, they all get shot in the neck. They all come here and those deer get donated after they've been tested. When they're done, they pick everything up. There's no bait left. Everything's gone. That's not hunting. Hmm. And, and to, to compare that to hunting, it literally apples to oranges. Um, now, we're paying those sharpshooters as well, and I could say, you can't use bait, and so you're just gonna have to sit out there and shoot whatever walk, well, dandy. Mm -hmm. Is that how you want your license dollars spent, or do you want them to get in there, remove that entire family group, every single one of those deer, and get out? That's what I want them to do, because it doesn't result in a population decline, but it might very well remove points of loci of, uh, of infection off the landscape. That's really important if we're gonna be successful. 
we've lost a couple of hundred deer maybe to CWD, if, depending on what numbers you want to look at. There's a lot of people out there that say, you know, we're just making too big of a deal of this. This is getting too restrictive, too hard for hunters to know what they can do, what they can't do. Are we making too big of a deal of CWD or are we not? First, let me say that I get what they're saying because at the end of the day, if you take the food and the fun out of hunting, people will quit doing it. I do it because I like the food and it's fun. As it turns out, when it becomes work, I need a job with wildlife services. You know, I'll go do that for a living. Um, so I get what they're saying. But we know perfectly well from the data out west that in some populations, the CWD is going to lead to extirpations. There will be no deer or very few, certainly not huntable populations. We'd have no idea what's going to happen in the Midwest. It could be something like that, or it could be a uh, broad enough infection like maybe happening in Wisconsin, and they're looking at that now, that instead of seeing deer go away, because we have real high fecundity here, you know, uh, does in the first year can actually come up with fawns the next, even mm -hmm. though they were sick. What you might just see is an extreme drop in the overall age of the population without necessarily seeing a huge drop in the numbers. I don't know which one is true. One of those will be true with CWD sooner or later. It will happen. Well, special thanks to Russ Mason for sitting down and talking with us about chronic wasting disease, deer management, the baiting and feeding ban. As we start to talk about this issue over the next few weeks, I think it's important for us to start with the DNR to understand why they're doing what they're doing. Now, you don't necessarily have to agree with everything that Russ had to say. I know I don't agree with everything that he said, uh, but it's important for us to understand why they're doing what they're doing. Now, what we're going to do in the consecutive weeks is we're going to be sitting down next week with Doug Roberts from Conquest Sense. That's a Michigan-based company here that makes deer lures here in the state of Michigan, and he's actually a deer farmer and deals with with whitetails on a level that most of us never will. And so he has a really good understanding of how whitetails work, a little bit more about this disease, and uh, we're gonna be hearing from him next week. And then kind of on the far end of the spectrum in the week following, we're gonna have what's been, in my opinion, the most vocal person against what the DNR is doing about really wanting to see this baiting and feeding ban lifted, and that is Ted Nugent. Uh, every time we have Ted on the show, we get a lot of response. Some people really love Ted, some people really don't, but I think his perspective is a good one to kind of the whole spectrum from what the DNR has to say to where Doug Roberts is and to where Ted is at. And I think what that really does is kind of starts the conversation, no matter where you are on this topic, uh, it just gets you more information to see uh, kind of where people are standing on this issue. And hopefully by the time we're all done with this, you'll be more informed. And hopefully we as hunters aren't going to be in the, I think we should bait or feed, or I think we shouldn't bait and feed, and that, that's okay. But to make sure that we support each other at the end of it and understand a little bit better about people on the different ends of the spectrum. So that's kind of our goal on this thing. And so that'll be happening over the next couple of weeks. What we're going to do now is shift gears and get to the world of fishing and join some guys in kind of the northern part of the lower peninsula out doing a little bass fishing. Now I'm throwing a topwater, a little uh, popping frog, trying to drum up a topwater strike. As soon as the sun gets a little bit higher, I'll probably switch to a wacky rig. Gary back there is throwing a jig right now. So. Um, on this lake, uh, usually uh, Cinco, wacky rigged, or uh, pig and jig, or lipless crankbait are my three favorites out here. Unless we get back into the lily pads and the shallows, then I'll get my frog out. I think that's probably one of my favorite ways to fish. Of course, it should be everybody's favorite way to fish. Who could stand the blow up on a frog, you know, and a bunch of lily pads? The anticipation is almost as good as the blow up. The topwater bite was a little slow, but we were finding a few fish on a jig and Cinco, a couple of tactics that these guys use on a regular basis. Today, we were hoping to find some bigger bass and decided to cover lots of water looking for them. Caught him on a wacky rig. Well, he might not be so small. <laughs> yeah, he's starting to fight now. <laughs> now he's mad. Well, it seems to be doing okay. We're still on fish, but we're not catching the big ones like we, we want to be, but 
there it seemed to like this this purple Yamamoto but uh let's like say natural shad does good in here too but let's go get some more These guys fish together quite often, and as anyone who fishes with a partner knows, sometimes one angler just has the hot hand. Today, Gary was putting quite a few fish in the boat, so I had to ask him if this is how it always goes. Do you always outfish your partner this bad, or is this? Not all the time. Sometimes he waxes me, but we do it. We're a team. <laughs> if I ain't catching them, I'm glad he's catching them. He's catching a lot of cookie cutters. And some keepers, but I'm trying to find a big one, so. I'll keep throwing this lipless for a while. If he starts catching big ones, then I'll, this thing will get put away <laughs> and go back in a rod locker. We're just catching them occasionally, like, like Gary is right now. We'll just keep right on moving. We'll keep the trolling motor on 25, 35% and just keep moving across these humps until we find a, a good school of fish, and then we'll sit on it for a while until he quit biting. That's how we fish this lake. I wouldn't say it's necessarily how we fish all of them. It depends on the lake we're at, you know, but obviously any lake, if you're getting them left and right, you're gonna stay in that particular spot until, you know, they quit biting, especially if they're bigger ones. If they're little ones, yeah, then maybe you need to move on, but. It's a heavy little rascal. Open up. Yeah, no. Bad size there. Going slow. I, I don't know what happened to him. We're still grinding it out. We looking for some big ones. We we got some small ones, but we need some big ones there to make make the day go by. They just stopped. Seem to be hitting this wacky rig for some reason. Maybe I have to get my dynamite out. Straighten it up. <laughs> but I I I don't know. Probably a breath of wind out here. That might have something to do with it. Randy and Gary have both been fishing for quite some time. And in addition to fishing for fun, they also enjoy the tournament side of bass fishing. I love the camaraderie, you know, tournament fishing. I love the competition. And uh, we got a good good bunch of guys in our club. So, I mean, it's, it's just a lot of fun. I mean, I really enjoy it. I've been doing this for 35 years. It's just relaxing. It, it relaxes me 100%. I'd rather do this than anything, especially work. I really started getting into it when I lived in Texas. I used to fish them big lakes. Lake Fork, Sam Rayburn, Toledo Bend, all them lakes, Choke Canyon. And I, my buddy took me fishing one time. I was hooked. And the next thing I know, my, me and my wife went out and I bought a little aluminum boat and then I got a bigger aluminum boat and I got a bigger, I got a a fiberglass boat and I got a bigger fiberglass boat. But now I'm, I think I'm done. That's why I got a buddy who's got a big boat, so I fish with him. Putting up a pretty good fight. Although we never did catch that big bass the guys were hoping for, we did catch several nice fish throughout the day and enjoyed some quality time on the water. Special thanks to Randy and Gary for letting me tag along on a fun day of fishing here in mid-Michigan.
Thanks for joining us this week for Michigan Out of Doors. Make sure you stick around in upcoming weeks. Lots of stuff on the schedule headed your way. We'll be chasing after both muskie and sturgeon. We're going to take a look at some of the new rules of the trails when it comes to snowmobiles and ATVs out there. Lots of great stuff happening. If you'd like to see where we are and where we're headed next, you can always check us out online. Well, that's right, Jenny. Online is a great way to kind of keep tabs on us. We're on most of the social media sites as well as our website, michiganoutofdoorstv.com. Full episodes of the show there. And if you're ever on YouTube, you can actually subscribe to our channel and get an email every time we post something new. So like we said earlier, lots of good stuff coming over the next few weeks. We're going to be going into that deeper dive on chronic wasting disease and the baiting and feeding ban. Get some more perspectives on that. And we have a lot of good fishing and some hunting is just around the corner. What a great time of the year to be a sportsman here in the state of Michigan. If we don't see you in the woods, or on the water. Hopefully, we'll see you right back here next week on your PBS station. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by by Greenstone Farm Credit Services, making recreational land ownership possible across Michigan and Northeast Wisconsin. Begin your land financing journey at one of Greenstone's 37 locations or greenstonefcs.com. By EOTech, a Michigan company, equipping law enforcement and sportsmen alike with quality optics creating jobs for Michigan workers on the web at eotechgear.com. By Huron Lady River Cruises in Port Huron, offering daily sightseeing trips and private cruises for all ages. Sightseers will experience the International Blue Water Bridge, Great Lakes Freighters, the Fort Gratiot Lighthouse, and more. Huron Lady River Cruises on the web at huronlady.com. Closed captioning provided by Randy's Hunting Center, serving Michigan as Ruger and Leupold's National Dealer of the Year an inventor of Ruger's 450 Bushmaster rifle. When I wander far away, a dream stays with me night and day. It's the road that leads to my home state. I am a Michigan man. Changing seasons paint the scene like rainbow trout in a hidden stream. The white-tailed deer in the tall pine trees. I am a Michigan man. I am, I am a Michigan man, that's where I'm from, and I'll show you my hands. Lord above, I love this land, I am a Michigan man. From the Keweenaw down to St. Joe, Kalamazoo, East to Monroe, to St. Marie and back again, I am a Michigan man. I am a 